It's a possibility that NATO is eyeing war as an increasing likelihood given the invasion of Ukraine. What was once thought impossible is now at the forefront of every member of NATO. Could Russia really declare war on the alliance? And could it win? To answer the question, we have to imagine an alternate timeline where Russia forces weren't bogged down in a never-ending fight for Ukraine, and instead opted for a more direct provocation against NATO. February 24, 2022 – Russian forces have been involved in a large-scale exercise with their allies in Belarus, but this has been a front to allow Russian forces to stage closer to the NATO countries of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. At 0600 local Moscow time, Russian autocrat Vladimir Putin releases a pre-recorded message relaying his intention to declare a special military operation meant to bring NATO aggression to heel. Right on cue, Russian missile strikes begin to rain down across Lithuania and Latvia. The first targets are military bases and airfields. The attack isn't a complete surprise to NATO, though, and the missile defense systems begin to knock Russian missiles out of the air. The Russian volley is overwhelming, and with a hit rate of 60%, missile strikes saturate military targets across the Baltic nations. Dozens of NATO's forward-deployed supply caches are destroyed, along with several key supply depots. Russia's long-range targeting capabilities, however, are deficient due to the 2014 sanctions against it and the banning of dual-use technology that crippled its space surveillance network. While many missiles hit their targets, many don't, often hitting civilian targets instead. After a blistering barrage lasting half an hour, Russia has failed to completely cripple the command and control or air defense networks of the two countries, and over half of the airfields remain operational. In the air, Russian planes piggyback on the missile assault. Thanks to NATO's superior long-range surveillance capability, its air forces are not caught completely off guard, and several combat air patrols have been on constant rotation ever since the military buildup along Russia's western military district and Belarus. But the incoming wave of air power is overwhelming for the few defenders in the sky, and from damaged airfields across the Baltics, NATO fighters are being rushed for combat. Their pilots, however, have to be recalled to base from their home or barracks, adding to the response time. The few fighters NATO manages to get in the air engage Russian targets with standoff attack long-range air-to-air missiles. These missiles allow NATO forces to operate from well outside the envelope of Russian ground-based air defenses, which ring the Baltic states. The first combat casualties of the Russian NATO war are Russian planes, but there are too few defenders and too many attackers to significantly stem the incoming air attack. With long-range missiles expended, NATO fighters are forced to move to positions just outside the threat range of the Russian S-400s and other mobile air defenses. Engaging Russian forces sent to neutralize them until forced to retreat to airfields in Latvia. With the missile onslaught and Russian air defenses in Kaliningrad on Lithuania's southern border, any surviving NATO aircraft can only be guaranteed some measure of safety further north in Latvia. But NATO has plenty of air defenses left operational, even after the opening missile barrage. In our real world, Russia proved unable to neutralize Ukraine's air defenses in its opening wave of attacks, despite having far superior air and long-range striking power. In this scenario, Russia is committing far more forces to the attack, but also facing far more sophisticated and better equipped defenses. As Russian planes are blotted out of the sky by air defenses, the Russian air offensive is briefly halted. Instead, more limited strikes against air defense networks are carried out by long-range standoff weapons. However, However, Russia has a limited availability of smart weapons, and its targeting capabilities are far inferior to NATO. Many air defense sites are destroyed or heavily damaged, with anti-radiation missiles taking out all important air defense radars, but defenses on the more western parts of the Baltics remain intact. Within minutes of hostilities, NATO's very high readiness response force has been activated. Soldiers on leave or at home are being recalled and a 5,000-strong response force of special forces, infantry, armor, and artillery is being assembled for immediate deployment. Within 48 hours, they'll be on the ground in the Baltics, ready to help stem the Russian onslaught. A few days later, they could be joined by NATO's response force, a rapid response force of 40,000 that includes combat air power and air support components. NATO maintains a contingent of around 1,000 strong of forward-deployed forces in the Baltics, and with the military buildup by Russia in recent weeks, this has been strengthened by an additional few thousand, along with several dozen aircraft. However, this is far insufficient to stop a Russian onslaught of 150,000 troops, even with Latvia and Lithuania's approximately 50,000 strong military. Of that number, not all are actual combat troops, with many being support and logistical personnel. So NATO's actual combat power in the ground numbers at barely over 12,000. Of more critical concern is the lack of tanks. Though Latvia and Lithuania both field nearly a thousand armored vehicles with some anti-tank capabilities. As Russian troops cross the border, NATO forces are ordered to retreat rather than engage the invaders. NATO's top general, Supreme Allied Commander General Todd D. Walters, is aware of the massive mismatch of forces across the Baltics. This exact scenario has been wargamed extensively, and the only chance NATO has of holding off the Russian military long enough for its response force to arrive is to force the Russians into fighting in major cities.
cities, where the terrain favors the defender and Russia's overwhelming firepower can be largely neutered. However, it's always been accepted that it was strategically impossible to guarantee the security of the Baltic members of NATO, given that stationing enough troops to do so would have required massive commitments of forward-deployed soldiers from across the alliance, a costly proposition, and a hugely destabilizing move that would have guaranteed a conflict between Russia and NATO much sooner than this. NATO will fight as best it can to hold the Baltics open for as long as possible, but its main response force already has plans to launch a counterattack from Poland, planning for the fall of Latvia and Lithuania within the first few days of fighting. Already Polish troops are digging in for an assault, either from Kaliningrad or Belarus, but such an assault won't be forthcoming. Russia's strategy to break NATO is to target the relatively undefended Baltic states, and then simply dig in. NATO will then have to decide if it wants to invoke Article 5 of the alliance's charter, stating that an attack on one is an attack on all, knowing that they'll be fighting an offensive war against an entrenched enemy in a conflict that could turn nuclear. Russia is betting that NATO's resolve is weak and it won't risk escalating the war. The assurance of mutual defense is a bedrock principle of NATO and should it fail, the alliance could be splintered. The United States, Poland, and the United Kingdom are staunchly committed to invoking Article 5 in any case of hostilities, but other member nations might not be as committed to waging war for countries that many of them weren't happy about joining NATO anyway. Some of them, like Germany, have deep financial ties to Russia already, and an end to Russian energy for Germany will be economically catastrophic. Only the coming days will determine if NATO invokes Article 5 in full. But for now, what is sure is that even if Russia is facing just Poland, the UK, and the US, it's still facing a significantly powerful force. The US just has to get its firepower to Europe first, a process that will take weeks to fully mature. In our fictional scenario, though, the US hasn't been blind to Russia's buildup of forces along its western military district and in Belarus. In this scenario, an invasion of Ukraine was possible, but the buildup of forces and supply depots along the borders with the Baltic states tipped Russia's hand weeks ago. Still, the US has delayed in deploying the bulk of its firepower to Europe in hopes of not destabilizing the situation further. But that doesn't mean it hasn't taken steps to move a significant force to its bases in Germany. A large contingent of its air power has also been moved to bases in mainland Europe and the UK and is now preparing for combat with the Russian Air Force. This has been a conflict the US Air Force has been waiting for for a very long time. Its F-15 Fighting Eagle was designed to kill Soviet MiGs, but today it's more than capable of sweeping the skies clear of Russian fighters. The US's F-35 fleet isn't fully operational yet, but dozens of the advanced stealthy planes are ready for combat, and as the Russians will soon find out, are absolutely game-changing. NATO's strategy is simple. Draw the Russians into NATO territory and away from their logistics hubs inside Russia and Belarus. Logistics has always been the Russian military's weakest point, and in our real world, a lack of logistical support has severely affected the Russian military's ability to fight in Ukraine. This is because Russian forces are simply not capable by design of fighting major land offensives far from their own borders. This sounds strange, given that Russia's greatest potential conflict was a major land war in Europe, so it seems like it should be something that the Russian military would be prepared for. Yet, for all the focus on new hypersonic missiles, overwhelming amounts of artillery, thousands of tanks and APCs, etc., etc., the Russian military has failed to learn the lesson it's been forcibly taught over and over again throughout history. A military can't fight without fuel, food, and ammo. Russian logistics focus on rail transportation, with an incredible capability to move troops and equipment within their own borders quickly and efficiently. Russian internal logistics are probably some of the best in the world, and they even have an entire corps dedicated to railway transportation, its building, repairing, and maintenance. But Russian railways stop at the Soviet Union's old borders. That's because Russia uses a wider gauge railroad track than the rest of Europe meaning that their plan to resupply forces via railroads stop at the Baltics in Ukraine. Adjustable carriages do exist, but engines cannot be made adjustable to fit both the Soviet rails and newer European rails. Thus, Russia would have to seize European engines to drive their railroad carriages into Europe proper. But NATO would never allow those engines to fall into the hands of the Russians for this exact reason. But whether delivering supplies to a railhead their trains can actually reach, or deeper into Europe with seized European engines, Russia still has a serious problem with logistics. Mainly, there aren't enough logistics personnel or equipment for the job of supplying all of its forces. Each Russian combined arms army is allotted a single material technical support brigade. Each material technical support brigade has two truck battalions with a total of 150 general cargo trucks with 50 trailers and 260 specialized trucks per brigade. The further an army moves from the railhead, the less trips that its resupply trucks can undertake, increasing the total length of time for resupply. 
At the current number of trucks available, there are simply not enough trucks for the operation more than a few dozen miles from a railhead, and that's before taking into account losses due to enemy activity and equipment breakdown. Take for instance Russia's heavy use of rocket artillery. Each Russian army has approximately 56 to 90 multiple launch rocket systems, and resupplying a single launcher takes up the entire bed of a truck. So if the entire MLRS force fired just one volley, it would require up to 90 trucks solely for resupplying ammunition. Those trucks then could not be used for anything else, like for example ferrying the fuel the MLRS needs to drive to a new location, or food or water or ammunition for the men manning the systems. Just a Russian army MLRS attachment is already taking up a significant amount of Russia's logistical capabilities, leaving the rest of its forces – tanks, APCs, infantry, tube artillery – with much fewer trucks for their own resupply needs. And again, this is before taking into account the fact that Russian logistics will be under constant enemy attack, or that resupplies further diminish the further from a safe railhead the Russian offensive moves. In our hypothetical scenario, NATO understands this all too well, and that's why as their forces retreat to pull the Russians deeper into NATO territory, special operations forces launch raids against Russian supply convoys before melting back into the countryside. NATO's strategy is to put up a mobile defense that keeps the Russians firing and burning gas, but places a tactical victory always just out of their grasp. Russian units are equipped to be independent of resupply for three to five days, but in intense urban combat, those figures shrink dramatically to just three days at best. By the dawn of the fourth day of fighting, Russian forces are forced to cease their advance toward Riga, starved of ammunition, food, water, and fuel. In Lithuania, though, they have managed to capture Vilnius, though partisan fighters are making the Russians suffer in street-to-street -street fighting. With superior reconnaissance capabilities, NATO was able to pinpoint Russian air defenses and send wild weasel aircrafts on a mission to destroy them. Taking from the example of Russian performance in Ukraine today, these suppression of enemy air defense missions succeed with astounding success. For longer-range S-400 and older S-300 batteries, F-35s equipped with glide bombs are able to overwhelm their missile defenses and destroy them without the S-400 ever getting off a single shot. Loitering MiGs defending from air attack are likewise unable to pick off the F-35s until they get to within close range, which very few manage to do without getting blown out of the sky. However, the number of F-35s is limited, which is where their capability to network with non-stealthy fourth-generation planes comes into play. With their advanced data links, F-35s are able to guide target bombs and missiles fired by non-stealthy planes who can carry out attacks far outside the threat envelope of Russian defenses. The results are devastating, and though a dozen F-35s are lost in combat, Russian air defenses are savagely mauled. The greatest factor of NATO's success, however, is Russia's own incompetence. Our real-world invasion of Ukraine has proven that the modern Russian military is nowhere near the formidable beast that Europe has feared. In fact, they're barely capable of carrying out modern combat operations, and it's only their overwhelming numbers that are seeing them slowly defeat Ukraine's forces. On the tactical level, we've seen time and again as Russian tank commanders don't make use of dismounted infantry to protect the tanks from anti-tank kill teams, leading to numerous deadly ambushes by Ukrainian forces using NATO anti anti-tank missiles. We've also seen as Russian forces practice no discernible convoy security procedures, with their convoys often coming to a complete stop at crossroads and other danger crossings, and without deploying security elements on their flanks to delay an enemy attack and allow the convoy to push through. Even their ability to prevent friendly fire incidents through discipline and communications is under question, as more than once, Russian units have engaged in full-blown battles between each other, much to the observing Ukrainians' delight. Perhaps most baffling of all is the destruction of Russian air defenses inside a convoy by Ukrainian aircraft, even when at a complete stop for several hours. Their Russian crews never bothered to turn on their radar and scan for threats. The scenario has also repeated itself numerous times. Lastly, we've seen time and again how Russian forces fail to properly respond to Ukraine Ukrainian ambushes. When caught in an ambush, the proper procedure is to either fight out of the ambush or assault through it. Instead, Russian forces are often seen scattering in a panic, while their comrades who stayed behind actually to assault the ambush are obliterated one by one. Forces outside of the ambush zone are commonly observed to either drive away in a panic or come to a complete stop and begin to back up. Instead, forces outside of an ambush should be deploying for a flanking assault on the ambushing enemy force, neutralizing the threat to their comrades stuck in the kill zone. All we've seen so far in Ukraine is indicative of one thing – the Russian military is largely poorly trained. But they're also operating equipment in various stages of disrepair, 
Some units enjoy more modern, well-maintained equipment and are appropriately deadly, but many others seem to be suffering from serious maintenance and modernity problems. Russian tanks, for instance, are being savaged by Ukrainian infantry armed with anti-tank missiles not just because of poor tactics in their deployment, but also because they lack active protection systems such as Trophy, which an increasing number of US combat vehicles are equipped with. They seem to also lack environmental sensors to help them pinpoint the source of the attack, leading to confusion and panic after an attack only made worse by poor discipline, training, and ever-shrinking morale. Often vaunted for its electronic warfare capabilities, the Russian military has proven itself incapable of securing its own communications in its invasion of Ukraine. As it turns out, an astonishing number of Russian units operate on completely unsecured radios. This has allowed the Ukrainian military and even amateur radio operators to interfere with and jam Russian radios. Ukrainians have hopped onto Russian frequencies to insult their invaders, play the Ukrainian national anthem on repeat for days at a time, and even jammed the frequency with white noise, revealing messages or images when analyzed digitally. Against NATO, unsecured communications spell disaster for the Russian military, as NATO electronic warfare operatives don't just jam Russian communications, but actively use them for sabotage. False orders are relayed over unsecured radios, causing entire Russian units to move out of formation or even launch attacks against phantom targets. Fluent Russian speakers wreak havoc on Russian forces simply by hijacking their unsecured comms. But because they must be very close to the front line to do so, their effectiveness is limited. As NATO's response force finally prepares for a proper engagement against Russian forces, their air forces launch a devastating assault from the air. American B-2 stealth bombers penetrate into Russian air defenses to destroy important communication hubs and surveillance radars, throwing air defenses into disarray. Much like in the first Gulf War, when Iraq used air defense networks modeled after Russia's own, these precision strikes by stealthy aircraft proved to be crippling for the air defense capabilities of Russian units. Add in serious resupply problems after constant missile and air attacks against Russian railways and strategically important bridges, and the Russian army's capability to defend itself in the air falls largely to its aerospace forces. But here too, NATO has the advantage. Russian pilots struggle to keep a 120-hour flight time minimum per year, while NATO pilots regularly fly nearly twice as many hours to maintain their proficiency. Maintenance problems also affect the Russian aerospace forces. In our real world, we saw two Russian aircraft simply fall out of the sky on the first day of Ukrainian invasion due to maintenance issues, and across the broader Russian Air Force we can expect similar levels of unreadiness. But it's better avionics, sensors, and longer-range anti-air missiles coupled with a sprinkling of F-35s that prove decisive in the sky. In the largest air battle since World War II, NATO forces wrestle control of the skies over the front away from the Russians, resulting in dozens of casualties on both sides. This opens up the greater use of air support to attack Russian army formations, though. And here again, another of NATO's strengths over Russia comes into play. Very few Russian pilots have multi role experience, while NATO pilots regularly fly both air superiority and air strike missions. For a NATO plane, switching from shooting down MiGs to blowing up tanks is as simple as switching the plane's munitions. But Russian air forces must use dedicated aircraft and crews for each mission. The lack of flexibility hurts Russian forces badly in Ukraine, especially in the opening days of the war. And this is why historically Russia relies heavily on artillery for fire support, not aircraft. Logistic problems have starved Russian artillery of ammunition, though, and even when fully supplied, Russian artillery is not very flexible. Needing to always stay under an umbrella of ground-based fire support has also significantly slowed Russia's advance. While NATO forces can better exploit tactical opportunities, thanks to their reliance on air power for fire support. Now NATO is on the offensive on the ground, not just in the air, and the final critical weakness of the Russian military is revealed. NATO attacks Russian formations across multiple fronts with smaller but much more maneuverable forces. This exploits an inherent weakness of the Russian battalion tactical group which is its inability to coordinate fire support against attacks coming from multiple directions. A lack of maneuver forces held in reserve also limits the Russian BTG's ability to respond to various new fronts at the same time. NATO's aggressive attacks across multiple fronts throws Russian commanders into disarray due to an inherent limitation in their command and control systems. Their electronic warfare and direct fire assets are formidable but incapable of focusing across a wide front. By comparison, the decentralized command structure of NATO forces allows them to maneuver three times as many units simultaneously, with each formation acting semi-autonomously and pursuing objectives and opportunities as they arise. The result is like a giant trying to swat away hundreds of bees attacking simultaneously. Where Russian blows land, they're devastating, and numerous NATO units are annihilated in fierce close-quarter combat. But while one front is being reinforced, a completely different front is being attacked, causing confusion and chaos at the command level. NATO's own electronic warfare assets and fire support only add to the quickly gathering fog of war that the Russian chain of command is suddenly finding itself fighting in. 
As nighttime rolls around, though, things go from bad to worse for Russian forces. As observed in Ukraine, Russian night attack capabilities are uneven and sporadic. Many soldiers lack basic night vision, and NATO tanks and armored vehicles have on the whole more capable sensors and imagers. This allows NATO vehicles to open up first and from further away. American Abrams Silver bullets prove particularly deadly versus Russian armor, just like they did against Russian tanks in the first Gulf War. T-72s make up the bulk of Russian armor, and while domestic models are better protected than export models provided to Iraq, the results are largely the same. T-90s fare better against NATO's more modern tanks, but there's simply too few of them and the front is too wide. The vaunted T-14, which was supposed to revolutionize tank warfare, never made it to full-scale production thanks to sanctions against Russia and its sputtering economy. The fight is not bloodless for NATO forces, though, and casualties quickly climb into the thousands after days of fierce fighting, with hundreds of armored vehicles lost on both sides. However, NATO operational superiority, high morale, better training, and largely more capable equipment proves to be decisive. Perhaps more than anything else, though, it's Russia's logistics that doom its military offensive into the Baltics. NATO forces have been savagely attacking Russian supply convoys, even at the cost of foregoing attacks against tank and artillery positions. NATO knows it's far more important to disrupt Russia's ability to resupply its forces than to actually destroy said forces. And now with Russian troops deep in the Baltics and far from their rail network, their supply difficulties increase exponentially with each truck lost. The Russian military has been pressing civilian trucks into service, but ongoing attacks against supply convoys and even the destruction of public roads makes resupply increasingly impossible. By a week of proper ground fighting between the two sides, Russian troops are surrendering in mass and abandoning their vehicles. We saw this in our real world in Ukraine, and continue to see it as Russia struggles to fix its logistics problems. Ukrainian forces have discovered entire convoys of Russian tanks and APCs abandoned due to a lack of fuel or food, their crews trying to hike back to friendly lines. Against a far more capable force such as NATO, these logistical problems become critical vulnerabilities that spell disaster for the Russian military. It's the same story across every facet of the Russian military that has proven to be, in the words of the retired American Major General Paul Eaton, unexpectedly incompetent and incapable of combined arms warfare. Stalin had a famous adage when asked about the West's technological superiority, quantity is a quality all its own. That might have been true back in his day, but today no amount of quantity can make up for the Russian military's complete lack of basic fundamentals. While a NATO-Russian war would be devastating for both sides, in a non-nuclear scenario, Russia has proven in its bungled invasion of Ukraine that it has no hope of victory against the obviously superior North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now go watch what would happen if Russia invades Ukraine, or watch this other video instead.